Hello, I am Lizzie with ECTV, and on today's show, Cheyenne will be interviewing Mr. Javier Gomez. Mr. Gomez has worked as an educator in Ventura County and is here to tell us a little bit about his story. Hi, I'm Cheyenne with ECTV. Today, I'll be talking with Javier Gomez, former Oxnard School District educator of 33 years and co-founder of the In the Catch Cultural Arts Center. Hi, how are you to, uh, doing today, Mr. Gomez? I'm doing fine. It's, it's great to be here and uh, to be able to talk to uh, uh, people in our community and let them know about what we're doing. Awesome. Would you mind starting with just telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, my name is Javier Gomez, and uh, I was uh, born in, in, East, in, in Mexico. <laughs> I was born in a town called Ramon Corona. Uh, when I was five years old, we migrated to the United States. My dad, uh, being an American citizen, uh, born in 1928 in Sonora, Arizona, wanted to uh, come back to the United States after his father uh, took him back to Mexico in the 30s during the period of the Repatriation Act, where Mexicans were being ousted out of the United States uh, during the after the Depression. And, uh, and so my, my, grand, my grandfather took the family back home uh, and founded a town called Ramon Corona, in which um, in 1950, that's when I was born, and, but my dad always had the inclination of wanting to come and live in the United States. And after he married my mom, and after five years, uh, he, did, he brought us to the United States. And so I settled in East Los Angeles, where I was where I was raised and uh, until I was 18 years old and that's when, the, that, that's when I decided to go off to college and, and do other things in life. Being an educator, what was your experience in the education system? I attended the uh, schools in the East LA area. I only spoke Spanish, so uh, as, to those of you that understood what I said, great. To those of you that didn't understand what I said, I was branded mentally retarded. So those of you who didn't understand what I said in, in Nahuatl meant that you are mentally retarded. So I was classified as a mentally retarded uh, child, put in EMR classes for, for six years. I never knew that I was retarded until I was almost ready to graduate from high school. And once I graduated from high school, uh, 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 actually my counselor called me in and wanted to know what I was doing, college prep courses. And I told her, I want to go to college. And so she said, you know, as, according to our CUM records, you're supposed to be retarded. And, and I use the word retarded, and, and that means because I want you to really understand the magnitude of the, the stigma that comes behind that word. And, and I, I, I said, oh, I didn't know that I was retarded. And, and uh, so she got me a scholarship to go to college because she was baffled by how did I end up escaping the EMR classes with an IQ of 74. And an overall IQ is around, around 110 or 115. Uh, anything above that is a genius, you know. So uh, I ended up going to college and, and I got out of uh, living, living in East LA and, and I attended uh, Northridge, the you know, San Fernando Valley State College at the time. Now it's called CSUN. Wow. What types of activities did you pursue as a child? Uh, myself, you know, I've always been in, in, in tune to the arts. Uh, I was a travieso, uh, meaning that I was, a, I was always getting in trouble as a young kid, but once I made my first Holy Communion, uh, that straightened me out, and so I followed the path of righteousness, and I tried to be a good, guy, good kid, and I, and I got involved in things that, 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 uh, that improved me, and, and at the age of 10 years old, I started working, uh, I got a job working in a, in a panaderia, a, a bakery, a Mexican bakery, and learning how to learn how to make my own money. Uh, my dad had uh, married, uh, remarried after the death of my mom, and my stepmother wasn't the, the kind, kindest person. So, so I had to make my own money to buy my own clothes because she wouldn't do that for us. And so uh, I ended up starting to work and being independent. I threw newspapers. I, uh, uh, I happened to be throwing newspapers on a sunny, rainy day. 
1965, uh, the Beatles had just landed in the United States. I'm throwing, getting my papers ready. My dad's asleep in the other room, and I'm all wet and getting everything all ready. And what song comes on but the inspiration of uh, It's a Hard Day's Night by the Beatles. And so with my little transistor radio, I listened to that, and that encouraged me. And I didn't know that I was falling into a new wave of change in our country. That that 1965 became an era of enlightenment and I was part of a, 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 a group of people that were feeling an unrest in our souls to do things and to be creative and to move forward and and so I attribute that that led me to my high school when I was in uh, graduating that if, before my counselor called me uh, we were involved in the Chicano uh, walkouts, the high school walkouts at my high school in Roosevelt High School. We walked out of our school because we were protesting against against not having food that represented our, our culture, not having histo history classes or classes taught about us as individuals, as Latinos living in this country. Uh, we, we wanted to see teachers that represented us as a people. Uh, the majority of our teachers at, at Roosevelt High School were, were either 90% uh, were white, maybe 5% black, and maybe 2 or 3% Latino. We had only a few. I just remember Mr. Macias, a, a coach for, for, for us in, in our PE department. That was the only person that we had. But, but we, we, we were un, there was an unrest in us. And so when we walked out, we were following the, 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 our other friends in other schools that were walking out uh, over at Lincoln High School where Sal Castro, who uh, was an inspirational Chicano teacher, was informing his kids to fight, stand up for their rights. And so I joined a, a period of great upheaval. What was the Chicano moratorium? Why was it important and what influence did it have? Uh, I saw the arrival of the Brown Berets in our school, and and we said, who are these guys? What are the Brown Berets doing here? But they were there representing a new change in our community. These were Latinos, Chicanos, who said, I'm, I'm going to protect our raza against uh, the abuse of the system, the institutions. And so I, I grew up in, in, in a period of great enlightenment that, that opened up my heart to seeing that there is a, a different world out there. We ended up in 1969 joining the, the, the Brown Berets led by Deves Sanchez to open up, uh, 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 to fight for our Chicano brothers who were dying in Vietnam. We, we protested against the Vietnam War. We said, raza si, guerra no. We, chart, we went on through the street and over a thousand of my friends joined us on marches to protest the war in Vietnam, to get our brothers back home and bring them home because 50% of the death rate in Vietnam was Latino. And, and at that time, our population as Latinos represented it in throughout the nation was only 20%. How is it that 50% of our, our community, our raza is dying in Vietnam? And that's not fair, that's not right. And so we ended up you know, joining the protest marches. What impact did the farm workers movement have on the Chicano moratorium? We were inspired by the words of Cesar Chavez, who was fighting for the rights of farm workers, who in 1965 went, took to the streets to protest against the inequities of farm workers feeling in the farm fields that they were asking for better wages, better working conditions, you know, security, uh, you know, uh, uh, benefits that will, will help the farm workers and, and ending the, 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 the bad treatment that these workers were receiving from the, the growers and their patriots uh, or their supporters of their, of their companies. And so we joined the movement of Cesar Chavez who showed us, who paved the way for us to see that it's all right to protest against the system. It's all right to stand up for your rights as a human being and for you to, to make changes in your society. You, you, you cannot stay dormant and accept the punishments of the society. We fought against the police brutality in our barrios because the police will come into our communities, 
see a Chicano dressed in a different way, and right away they're they're arrested or beaten by the police, and they will get away with it. You know, at that time we should have been shouting, "Brown lives matter." You know, and 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 that we had to stand up for those those brothers and sisters who were being beaten by the police. So we had a lot of a lot of challenges that we were trying to change. You know, the, the edu edu educational school system discriminated against people who spoke a language other than me. I didn't realize that I was being discriminated against or being put in a program that, that, that was directing me and into being a failure to the, our school system. You know, the, uh, the Los Angeles School District wanted to understand why over 50% of, of Latinos were dropping out of school. Why was why weren't they continuing beyond high school? And and the answer is, you know, when you don't treat somebody with dignity and you don't respect them, when you deny them the equal rights uh, of the Constitution, when you deny them their language or their foods or role models to to represent them, you know, it it it, is, it, it challenges you to say, you know, ya basta. That's enough. We had enough, you know. So, so in my era that I grew up, it was an era against the war in Vietnam, the right for farm workers to, to have a better life. Uh, the educational school system needed to be changed. The policing, you know, had to be changed. The politics of our community. Again, you know, schools were uh, were represented only by by other other races than Latinos. Who were the who who was a Latino on board? You know, in, in 1967, I told the story. I read a story about Crystal City, a city back in Texas, that young ladies wanted to be cheerleaders, and they were denied access to being cheerleaders. They complained to their parents, crying. They said, I want to be a cheerleader, Mom. I want to support my school. I want to be part of the school environment. And and what, what the parents said, well, well, we'll go to the board. And other leaders in the community joined them, and they went before the board. And they asked the school board, you know, we want our daughters to have the chance to uh, try out for cheerleading at this their high school. And the answer that was that was given to them according to their to their principal and their coach was these young Latina girls don't have the dexterity or the mental capability to handle the heavy stress of being a, a cheerleader for the school. And they said, huh? And the community was not satisfied with the answers because they said, That's, this is not fair. This is discrimination. And, and so what they did was that they organized. Being, living in a community of 90% Latino and the board being all white, they went after the board and they recalled all the entire board and got them off and reelected a new board that represented the community. And then they called the principal in and they asked the principal, so are these girls going to have a chance to cheerlead? And he said, oh, according to our coach and, and our records, these girls can't handle it. Well, they told that principal, says, we well, better find a job somewhere else because you're not, you're not working with our students, our kids in our district. But you're gone. And so they fired him. And then they looked at the coach. Are you going to give them a chance to cheerlead? And obviously the coach was trembling because he was more concerned about the security of his job than, than and, and, and being politically right. And so... He, he gave them a chance, and those girls joined the cheerleading squad. That's just a small little sample, but it was what influenced and what empowered them was what the farm workers did, who finally stood up against the most giant uh, agricultural business conglomerate uh, giants of our country and said, Chale, we're, we're going to go against you. We, we want better wages for our workers. You know, even, we even had presidents of the United States uh, and the governor uh, buying up, helping the growers to buy their, their grapes and sending them to Vietnam and, 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 and uh, to bypass the power of, of, of letting the companies uh, suffer the boycotts that Cesar Chavez led throughout the nation. And, and, uh, and even our government was against our, the farm workers, finally standing up against you know, somebody that's powerful. And finally, it took President, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Attorney General 
uh, Robert Kennedy, who came to investigate what was going on in California. And, and when he met with uh, the growers and the farm workers at a, at a round table meeting, uh, uh, the growers, uh, the, Mr. Kennedy asked, asked the, the chief of police, why did you arrest those, those farm workers who went to, to this farm to protest? Oh, they're going to create violence. They, they have violence in their minds. They have, uh, they're going to they're gonna destroy the property of the, of the growers. And, and, and Kennedy said, you can read their minds? Have you ever read the American Constitution? That everybody has the right to uh, uh, speak freely in, 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 any, in any setting and to assemble freely? Have you read the Constitution? Oh, 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 no, it's just that the, we know that this is a bad element. They're going to create violence. They're going to destroy property. And so, so Kennedy, in, you know, got on their case and became a champion for the farm workers. And, and changes began to happen. Finally, the, farm, the, the growers finally caved in after losing millions of dollars, not wanting to support what the demands were of the farm workers, of the Filipinos and the Mexicanos working in the fields for better wages and better working conditions. You know, I mean, they were not asking much. They were asking for a bathroom in the fields, for water in the fields, for an opportunity to have a break to eat lunch or have a break to just to relax and to be out of the hot, scorching sun when it's extremely hot and, and to have a break during that time period. Is that difficult? You know, before there wasn't any far, there, there wasn't any bathrooms in the fields. Imagine what women would have to do. Men could get away with a little, a little bit, but you know, they were they were fighting for basic needs and also the working conditions and better wages. Thank you for for your insight on that and all those topics. I would like to ask you now, um, how did your journey as an educator begin? What inspired you to pursue a career in education? Well, I go back to the year that the Beatles came in, and I was swept into this new wave of change, uh, this sense of trying to be a, 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 a change agent in our community. Um, when I went to Northridge, uh, it happens that, that there were finally recruiting at San Fernando Valley State College students, Latino students. And that was part of the pull to bring in students from barrio schools to attend universities. And so I was given an opportunity. Uh, my brother was there. He sent a letter to me and said, hey, you know what? They're recruiting a lot more Chicanos to come to the university. And so there was 50 of us when we arrived that first summer to, in 1969 to attend San Fernando Valley State College. And that we were all energized because we're all being politicized. I was involved in the walkouts in East LA. In 1969, our classrooms uh, uh, from the department, the his history department that I belonged to, which was the Chicano Studies Department that was just created, gave us, gave us the latitude to go out there in the streets. Our classroom was the streets. We were organizing, we were protesting, we were uh, helping people in our community to empower them. And, and we would report back to our teachers, hey, this is what we did today. This is, we, we just helped organize. We just stopped uh, people going uh, shopping at Safeway Markets. You know, we, we, we uh, helped out in our school. We were marching against the war in Vietnam in 1969, December 19 when the first Chicano moratorium took place. I was part of that Chicano moratorium. My brothers, my, uh, my two brothers followed along with me and we were part of that movement. And over a thousand people marched to protest the war in Vietnam. So when I got to Northridge, it, 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 uh, it was all connected. And so my, my whole course of study was of empowerment, of enlightenment. And in 69, we also happened to have the opportunity to take food and clothing and money to Cesar Chavez in Delano, California uh, to help out the striking workers over there. And when we did, we were fortunate to, to see Cesar Chavez walk up to us, bringing his two dogs, Huelga and Boycott, to us. And he called us into his office, sat us down, and he pointed at us and he said, you know, I have a heavy load to take care of the, uh, the lives of, of all my workers. 
I need to ensure that they have better working conditions, better uh, uh, benefits, or that they have uh, uh, safe working conditions. You know, so I have a, my plate is heavy, but I'm worried about their their children. So I need you as college students. When you finish your degrees, go back to the communities and go and empower the youth. These their children. These are the youth of the future who will be the next trustees of our destiny to to chart a new direction, a new life for us, where they're going to become the lawyers, the teachers, the the uh, edu the uh, politicians. They're going to become the uh, people that are going to be the change agents. They're going to be that that person that's going to make a million dollars and is going to redonate his money back into the community to empower and 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 help out his community. Where did you teach? You know, little did I realize that I was going to come back to Oxnard after I graduated from Northridge to come to the city of Oxnard to, as, as part of, of a program called Operation Chicano Teacher. I was brought into the, into the Oxnard area to help alleviate the, the court order that was mandated to, uh, uh, to end segregation in the Oxnard School District. Juan Soria fought for, for the schools to be open. And, and he, he made that, he, he won his case. And, and because of him, teachers, Latino, pe people of color were being brought into the Oxnard area, blacks, uh, in Native Americans, and, and especially Chicanos. And so in 70, and 72, 73, a whole new wave of educators came into the, into the Oxnard area. I happen to be one of those educators. What needs did you identify in the students that you taught? For what purpose? One, to become the role models, to become the teachers in the classrooms, to become the change agents who will introduce bilingual education into the classrooms. We spoke to our students. We pre presented our students' hopes. I, I feel really great because when I was teaching, my kids would come up to me and they would touch my pants and they say, Ay, maestro, you smell so good. Oh, my father, he works in the fields, he smells so ugly. And, and you know, and, and those young kids that I had back in the 70s are now teachers working for the Oxnard School District. And so my role was fulfilled by seeing them become the teachers or seeing one of my young girls become an MD working for CMI here, in, here in, 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 Ventura, in Ventura County. And so I, I, I saw the importance. So when I came in, we came in as, as teachers to empower our community and also to fulfill the, the, the vision and mission of Cesar Chavez, how to empower the youth of our community. Because when you empower youth, they, they feel the power to overcome. They, they will see that their future is sealed because nothing can tear them down or stop them from achieving their goals. Thank you very much for, for your insight on that. Um, we're nearing the end of our time here, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. um, before we close, though, I, w I was hoping, uh, could you just uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about what uh, what motivates you? What inspires you for your future aspirations? What inspires me is is hope. What inspires me is the word in La Quech. Uh The word in La Quech that means you are my other self. If I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. I want to create that hope that no matter who we are in our society, that we can stand tall and we can walk and enjoy all the fruits in, of our society, that we're welcome anywhere in our community, that, that uh, we won't be discriminated against. And if we are dis being discriminated against, we need to learn how to stand tall. What does the term Chicano mean? What are its origins as a term? I call myself a Chicano because uh, a Chicano means one that loves his culture, two, one that uh, will stand up for the rights of, of others, and three, one who is a humanist who will embrace society and show the people that, that because our skin is different or, or, or we come from different backgrounds, doesn't make us any, any more better than somebody else, but makes us equal to celebrate each other's 
richness because each one of us brings something to the table and each one of us empowers the other. We enrich our lives with each other. Uh, somebody that comes from Africa and they bring in their culture, I, I'm empowered by the fact that I'm learning about their, their heritage, their, their people, and celebrate them. And for them to learn about, hey, you know what, I got tacos. You want a taco? Uh, or you want a chimichanga? I got those too. But, but, you know, we can celebrate each other. We can embrace each other. And, and that, that, that to me is the meaning of all these colors of the of rainbow coming together. This co these colors that come together. You know, and, and when we celebrate this rainbow, we celebrate life. We celebrate the life that we all cherish and want for each one of us. Just as Dr. King dreamt that one day, he wanted to see children holding hands. And little black children, little white children holding hands, little brown children holding hands, all together, walking together, and jumping in that jolly jumper together and enjoying uh, a hot dog or a pizza or a chimichanga and an horchata and singing to the song of El Rey and dancing to to the rhythms of of our artists of our today you know that's that's the beauty that's what motivates me what motivates me is is seeing the eyes of of our children becoming us as in the future for they are the des they represent our hopes and dreams in our destiny thank you so much for coming in today mr gomez and well, we hope to have you back again soon. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you for watching. I am Lizzie, and I hope you enjoyed the show.